Cool. Uh, hello, everybody. I've got quite a lot of content. This is uh, a bit of a longer talk, but instead of cutting it out, I'm going to skip over some bits with some brief descriptions and leave it in the slides. So if the stuff you want to dig into, it is all available. So I'm Andy, done various things that I'm sure a lot of people have here. And I want to talk about vulnerabilities in open source software and how they're exploited and how containers can protect us from them. So a vulnerability, a flaw or weakness that can be exploited to violate the system security policy. Are containers really secure? Do they really contain? What can they contain and how have they defended against major recent vulnerabilities? Our users expect their data is safe when they hand it over to us. So is it possible to protect all data? Well, we can't protect data if code in the system has bugs and unspecified code paths. So is bug-free code possible? And if not, is anything completely secure? Or secure from teenagers? <laughs> so this talks about security, the anatomy of some recent vulnerabilities, containers, some, uh, a brief rundown of various tools that can go into pipelines to defend ourselves continuously, and, um, and how we defend ourselves from future vulnerabilities. So what's security? Broadly, it's the full knowledge and control of a system and its data without reading that data. So to achieve security, we must trust certain parties. We trust GPG, the Global Public Root Store. These guys encrypt our data in transit. But then we also trust closed source. We trust operating system vendors, driver manufacturers, compiler engineers. And we're trusting these guys not to have bugs that defeat our security models. And most importantly, we trust open source code that we can see and audit, and hopefully that also has been audited at some stage. So why do we use open source? Cost, development appeal, interaction with other servers. Security? Well, Linux's law states, given a large enough beta tester and the code developer base, almost every problem will be characterized quickly and the fix obvious to somebody. We'll see whether that holds up. So while open source has the potential to be more secure than its closed source counterparts, Simply being open source is no guarantee of security. But what does open source really mean when we want 100% security? Is anything completely secure? Well, recent breaches suggest not. So we'll go through some of these recent internet melting vulnerabilities with a focus on web server and container exploitation, their impact and mitigation, and see what part containers have to play. Um, sorry, they've all got fancy names. Uh, so Heartbleed a catastrophic flaw in OpenSSL, a commonly used encryption library referred to as a modest code base of outsized importance. This was considered theoretically unexploitable by, ironically, Cloudflare, and an attack proven by uh, a security researcher inside nine hours, at which point Cloudflare revoked and reissued all of their certificates. Heartbleed affected 25 to 50% of all major, of well, of major sites, at disclosure, it impacted Apache and Nginx, email servers, OpenVPN, and more. So what is it? It's a problem in SSL heartbeat handling. A user sends a heartbeat question to a server, asking it to keep a persistent connection open. And importantly, they send the length of the expected reply word. This is unnecessary, as the server should check the length of the untrusted data on the server side without trusting user input almost exclusively. So a malicious user can specify a fake length for the expected reply, in this example 500 bytes, and the server replies with the reply word and the next 500 bytes of private memory. So this is private information about other connections to the server that may also contain private keys, and once the attacker has those keys and he can place himself in the middle of the network traffic, he can decrypt all communications with that server. This breaks our security model, evidently. So we can't see this attack in the logs because it's performed during the initial handshake of an SSL connection. And the poor guy involved missed validating the length of a variable containing a length. It's not quite. He missed validating a variable containing a length, which is an easy enough mistake to make, especially in C. So reading more data than the buffer should be allowed is called a buffer overrun. And it was discovered by fuzz testing with American Fuzzy Lop, which is a fuzz application. A fuzzer sends a massive amount of random data into the inputs of a program, and it can be used to find untested code paths. 
AFL is an advanced fuzzer that uses genetic algorithms and instrumentation of the code to try and brute force the application in an intelligent manner, manner, thereby reducing the total amount of time it takes to find bugs. In a problem space with as many permutations as an average piece of cryptographic software, this is very important. So the user mitigation for this exploit is to update OpenSSL. Was OpenSSL more secure for being open source? Probably, because the instrumentation of the source code was required for, open, uh, for AFL to do its work. So this bug may never have been found without access to that code. So containers, how do they work? Well, in this case, the host's memory is protected. But Heartbleed only leaks process memory anyway. In this case, the web servers, the context of the application that's running inside as a library. So containers don't really help against this type of programming flaw. In container terms, a container security checks are not at the right level. It's an attack on the implementation of a spec and application behavior, but containers do help because presumably the use of containers result in immutable deployment artifacts and a quick continuous deployment pipeline that means at least when a vulnerability is found in a package that we rely on, it can be updated quickly and tested. So while there's no inherent defense from problems with protocols, containers mitigate the upgrade cost slightly. So in kernel and container terms, Heartbleed is like building a castle, securing the walls, and then having the gates, give, guards give away the private keys. So, onto the next vulnerability. Shellshock was a bash vulnerability allowing privilege escalation by adding code to a specially crafted environment variable with the calling process executing the extra code in the context that it shouldn't be allowed. Um, so some impacts, CGI web applications, SSHD, DHCP clients, OpenVPN, and all Linux boxes and all FreeBSD boxes and all post-1991 Unix deploys and Macintoshes. That's more or less every Unixy based system for all of us here. So here's a demo HTTP request. The top line is the actual call and uh, the user at this, the HTTP head is going in. So you can see that the user agent actually contains the payload. The parenthesis is a function definition defined as a no-op within the curly braces and then a close of the definition and the actual exploit to run. Uh, so in this case, pinging a host, ID, and then the output of etc password. This is burp suite used to actually fire that call off. You can see at the bottom, this is data that should never be leaked to an attacker or any user in a standard HTTP call. Um, you'd only see this in the web server logs if you were logging headers, which is relatively abnormal. And this bug was in the initial implementation of the function importing and exporting spec in bash since 1989, from Bash's original author. This was before HTTP existed, before the web was born, and before Linux was even released. So it would be incredible if this bug was not being exploited at some point in those 25 years. There are many CVs for this bug. It was finally fixed by Florian Weimar, um, a Red Hat employee. And of note is that the latter two bugs on this list were both discovered using AFL, again. So the mitigation for this bug upgrade, was it more secure for being open source? Well, considering the breadth and the impact of this vulnerability and the time it took to find, then it's probably not more secure for being open source. But did containers help? Absolutely. They isolated the attacker once they were able to run code on the host just to the container running that code. The host is isolated and the impact is cushioned. This is, as opposed to Heartbleed, this is a remote command execution. So we can contain the command when it's run on our servers and protect the host. Back to the castle, the perimeter is secure, but this is equivalent to allowing a Trojan horse through the gates of the castle, but locking it in the dungeons. Even if it's malicious, we can observe it and prevent it from doing further harm. It can be controlled and observed. The next vulnerability, drown is an attack on TLS. And because it's a protocol attack, similar to Heartbleed, it can't be defended with containers. The problem is old US export grade cryptography, 33% of sites vulnerable at disclosure, mitigation, disable OpenSSL2, and upgrade, rotating any secrets that may have been leaked. As a side note, there are a lot of TLS attacks that containers can't help with, excuse me, and why so many? Why the cluster after May 2013? Our friend Edward Snowden. Post Snowden, a renewed vigor was applied to cryptography and protocols 
as developers search for intentional or accidental vulnerabilities. So is TLS more secure for being open source? Well, the complexity of this attack requires a cavalcade of academics and researchers. So it's likely that it would, maintain, it would remain the level of state active vulnerabilities, which is no excuse not to fix and patch it. So back to the castle. This is like securing the entrance to the castle with an obstacle, only allowing people over a narrow, secure bridge and then turning a blind eye as the moat is drained and continuing to trust it provides security. Can containers help? It's a protocol attack. No amount of containers can protect us against broken specifications. The only benefit we reap is being able to redeploy quickly. The next vulnerability, dirty cow. This is a Linux kernel bug in the kernel since July 2007. Was this more secure for being open source? Well, probably not because of the time it had been open for and it was being explored in the wild. The URL is dirtycow.ninja, which is probably the worst of all vulnerability URLs. It's a race condition in the kernel. So it's a copy on write condition whereby the, uh, an unprivileged process requests to write to a, process, a piece of memory owned by root. The kernel will copy that to another position and then mark it as available to the user to write to, at which point the user can write. It's a copy on write. However, the race condition exists because when it's copied, the piece of memory that it's copied to is still owned by root. And it's possible, as we'll see in a moment, to hook in to the observation of the process right into that piece of memory and run different code in the root context, ultimately rooting the, uh, the context that one is in. So uh, this is a race condition in the kernel. Docker can't help against kernel problems because every container relies on the same system call interface to the kernel. Regardless of whether the Docker image ships with any sort of libraries or kernel related code, system calls will be proxied straight through to the host. So the mitigation is upgrade once more. And of note, this bug was found in the wild by the security researcher involved by recording all tra traffic onto his server. He had a rolling packet capture, discovered somebody was attempting to do something slightly bizarre, extracted the binary from his logs, and then reported it to the kernel. That's it's just insane. Um, props to the guy, yeah. Security researcher. Uh, so how containers helped? Well, they didn't contain the bug because the kernel is relied upon by Docker for a level of isolation that it did not provide. So, back to castles. It's like uh, the castle being built on the biggest rock you can find and they're being surprised when somebody tunnels in from underneath and circumvents any defensive processes. So I said the container can do nothing. Actually, there are some things that it can do. And we'll demo this bug now. So do a container breakout to root the host from inside a container. And then afterwards, look at how we would secure that container in the future. In the meantime, there's one other vulnerability, which is uh, wonderful, but I won't go into it. Also, Cloudflare, um, Cloudbleed. Again, there's some discussion around this, but it's uh, probably, I don't have time to do it now. So what do these vulnerabilities have in common? Humans making mistakes, this will never cease. Humans not part of the development teams discovering and reporting the bugs, which is very important. Fuzzing applications yields fantastic results. And containers are not a panacea. There are plenty of vulnerabilities and attacks that they either cannot stop or are misconfigured for. We'll examine those shortly. And there's no way to compare this to closed source because there's uh, no similar vulnerability disclosure policy for closed source applications. Um, you can help open source, call to arms, fuzz code, uh, donate to OpenSSL, etc. Um, no mitigation except for grade. Sorry this is so fast. As I said, there is a lot of content in here. Uh, but let's, uh, let's do a container breakout. So this is potentially the most insane to demo because it's a race condition, and I'll demo it inside a VM with my CPU stepping down. Um, this is, uh, it was vulnerable from July 2007 until the end of last year, on all Docker versions. Uh, and here we go. So what we've got here is, uh, what we've got here is a vagrant image running an intentionally old and vulnerable kernel. Uh, 4.2, and this is all scripted, but we'll be able to see exactly what's happening as it goes through. So first of all, all right, so uh, at the top, slightly offset, uh, is the actual exploit itself. So that's the script, which just wraps it. Here we have uh, sysdig, which is tracing the system calls that the exploit will make. The binary is called uh, dead beef, wonderfully, 
And so this is essentially looking for any process called dead beef and it'll track any output that, uh, it'll track all the system calls that that makes. Uh, here we have um, Sysdig again looking for file descriptor uh, pointing to traffic on a port 1234. What will happen is once the exploit achieves root, it will then connect back to a listening socket inside the container as root. So from inside the container, we'll then be able to send commands across that socket to, to a process running as root on the host, effectively uh, routing the host and breaking two layers of security, one the actual container itself and the other the Linux privileged process. Um, here we've got D message, which will become relevant later. And at the bottom, uh, because this is a race condition and it fires off many threads or many calls in parallel, uh, any one of those could trigger the condition, possibly two could do it simultaneously. So this temp.x file on the host uh, will be written to as soon as the process, as soon as any of the processes uh, gain roots. So it's essentially like a, like a lock. So, um, what has happened here is uh, that is pseudo, uh, sorry, that is Sysdig monitoring the process. That is the port we're looking at, the message, the third window, and at the bottom uh, we have the .x file and temp. So this is the container being built. You can see it's just from Debbie and Jesse. Excuse me. This is the vulnerability patching the virtual dynamic shared object, which is a way of caching system calls that are quite expensive, um, which in this case is how the exploit is actually loaded into the piece of memory. Uh, ptrace is the system call that's used to actually catch. It observes, it's, it observes the process that it's called from and hooks in. And what we'll see is the mAdvise call, which is essentially uh, talking to the kernel about pieces of memory. And that's where the vulnerability lies. So we'll see that process getting hammered. And then we'll see the ptrace call come in and try to intercept every single one of those calls and uh, ideally, ultimately trigger the vulnerability. So here we are, this is, uh, so proceed, we're just gonna have a look and see. Uh, so this is now just running a simple script that checks for, whoops, they, ah, that's probably not. Uh, it's running, sorry, <laughs> I used the mouse at the wrong time. So this is just running. That's uh, gone off the back of the buffer. Okay, never mind. Um, but essentially, it's just something showing that we're vulnerable on this kernel version. So, this is... Uh, ah, and I pressed the wrong button at the wrong time. I do apologise. So, we can just close these down and do that again. Okay. So at this point, we do want to proceed, yes please. Uh, this is the Linux exploit suggestor that I tried to show you. So we can see the kernel version is 4.2.0 and there's various other things wrong with this, but Dirty Cow is one of, the, uh, one of those things. So run with AppArmor, in this case, no, and that will become relevant in a moment. And that is immediately seg faulted, which suggests to me that it's not exactly what I expected it to be. Um, why is that, I wonder? Uh, so it may be the case that since I re-downloaded this VM image, it's changed underneath me. <laughs> okay, no, I think I pressed the wrong button again. So what's happened here? Um, so this is the other demo. It might, uh, in the interest of time, I won't spend too long trying to figure out what I've done, but... Um, let's just try, uh, because it is quite an interesting demo, I will just take a moment to try and do it again. Um, let's keep on going and uh, see if we can get it working in a moment. Uh, so that's <laughs> the non-deterministic live demo truth form. Uh, but, essentially, so let's assume that that just broke out of a container, and I'll come back to it and attempt to do it again in a moment. But the recap from that would be, we can't secure everything. We know there are always problems in software development that will generate bugs, 
and the cost of formally specifying everything or taking extensive testing measures is extremely high. Security struggles to keep pace with the cadence of software delivery. Um, DevOps revolution means shipping software fast, sacrifices security. And unless we start to be penalized for insecure software, our competitors as a whole will overtake us and will go bust. So the speed of shipping features is a competitive advantage. Uh, so back to software, is it possible to write bug-free code? Will Smith says no. <laughs> Only with sufficient time and conformance, conformance to specification does not necessarily guarantee the absence of bugs. Uh, there is some interesting stuff from NIST about this, but let's just see if this is working yet. Uh, da -da -da. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, one last time. Okay, so let's try again. Proceed. Yes, please. Uh, we've seen that. Run with App Armor, not on this occasion. Lovely. Okay, so this is what's supposed to be happening. Uh, this is the P-Trace call that we were talking about earlier. So a lot of M advice calls have already uh, been made, and then we're trying to P-Trace all of them. You can see from the speed that this is updating, that's still on the first second we started this. There's a huge amount of traffic going in to the syscall interface. Um, this might take a little bit longer than, ah, oh, there we go, happy days. So what's happened there is we can see the, the exploit is actually self-diagnosed um, its completion, but at the bottom we can see this file is now owned by root. You can't see that. Uh, yeah, you can see it's owned by root, the UID in the middle. And if we go up here, we've now got, uh, so, so this is the socket back to the host that I mentioned earlier. So you'll see traffic through there. Uh, and who am I is root. And if we check the process tree, we will be able to see all sorts of things that are not inside the container. Most notably, the Docker container processes themselves. Um, and you can see dead beef nested in itself there, three or four lines from the bottom. So just to recap, that was, a Docker container breaking out of Docker and gaining root privileges on a host system. So uh, you may have guessed from uh, the mistakes that were made along the way exactly how that is to be mitigated against, but we'll restart that machine. Um, the exploit can repatch the virtual dynamic shared object itself, but it's uh, not guaranteed to work. So I'm just going to shut down the VM and start it up again. And we'll come back to that in a moment. OK, so the recap, can everything be secured? No. Um, what we have here is uh, NIST has published a really fascinating paper, actually, about reducing software vulnerabilities that climaxes with the recommendation to use containers, but without a word of the configuration thereof. And it is the most important part of using containers. Uh, these are just here for posterity because I won't go through them now. Um, but essentially, use a good team, measure everything, be nice to people. It's kind of self-evident. Uh, this is a great book, Secure Programming How-To. Um, this guy really knows his stuff. Uh, yeah, so these are all the things that are recommended, um, but noticeably, uh, resilient architecture is a, a way of defending against the absence of those things and uh, the foundation that we should, we should be building upon. So let's examine then the best practices with regards to deploying containers. Uh, all these things, is it good at, containers good at security? Well, arguably, um, they have taken quite a long time to implement native kernel security extensions. Um, so the kernel doesn't provide a namespace for everything. There are various subsystems that are shared still, including the user namespace, importantly, which means that you can fork bomb one container and take down your whole system. Uh, that will be fixed by user namespaces version two, which is still pending, it's kernel again. The age old criticism of running the daemon as roots. Uh, there's the ultimate student from um, university, uh, somewhere in Sydney, um, somewhere in Australia, like 21 years old, and it's basically written rootless run C, which means going through and taking all the times that kernels request, uh, sorry, that container run times request a privilege operation and finding another way to do it and fixing various things upstream in the kernel. Um, it's truly insane. Check out rootless run C. It will mean that you can run containers without the Docker daemon being root. Uh, that's actually, but that, that, uh, that PR took about a year to get merged, and it's, it landed about a month or two ago. So that will happen soon. Um, the oldest of critiques, containers make isolation trade-offs versus a hypervisor. 
We all know this. If we consider how the major cloud players, for example, Google will run a container with the virtual machine inside with further containers inside that. So the nested model, which is now being popularized by Intel Clear containers and Hyper.sh as a startup that's doing it, uh, does provide greater isolation and with uh, the very fast startup times of, uh, of these sort of micro hypervisors, that will become an increasingly viable option for an extra layer of security around, um, around container runtimes. So um, the good thing about container security, the default configuration is really good. Um, minimal attack surface, try not to pile too many things in a container and you'll reduce the uh, viability of an assault. Um, the speed of deployment we've spoken of about. Uh, native log drivers post-mortem analysis is important. Many vulnerabilities have been prevented by default by the default configuration that ships with Docker, and we'll have a look at that as well. Notably, those that don't are kernel-related again. So how does Docker provide the security hardening namespaces? So the PID namespace, for example, gives two different PIDs to a child process. Uh, the first PID gets PID1, it thinks it's an init process, but the host machine and root on that host sees it as PID8 within its process tree. So it still has full control from the host, but the frame, the window, and the view into the world inside the namespace is one of complete perceived isolation. Uh, these namespaces exist for network, mounted directory paths, system processes, uh, enterprise communication. The user namespace, as I mentioned earlier, is still flaky, and version two will be a lot better, but there are still some uh, major concerns around that. Um, C groups are another major component of Linux containers. They provide resource accounting and isolation, so you're allowed to run on this CPU, you're allowed this much CPU time slicing, you're allowed this much memory, et cetera, and they can help prevent denial of services. Um, various configurations, like uh, setting read-only file systems, and kernel capabilities. These are a very low process um, permissions model that are meant to be a granular division of all the possible uh, permissions afforded to root. So root can do whatever he wants, but for example, if you run the ping command and you just want to open a raw socket, start writing like ICMP stuff to it, then if you look at that process on an Ubuntu system, it will be given just the equivalent app armor permission to just, um, it's cap Nessus admin, to just do a privileged network operation. It doesn't need to be able to read EC password or other things that root can do. Um, the Linux kernel has over 600 system calls. A bug in any one of those is a potential attack surface. So Docker reduces this significantly. Um, it actually blocks the majority of system calls by default. Um, if we look at what Dirty Cow is exploiting, then the ptrace call that it uses to identify itself and run that untrusted code as root is actually attempted to be blocked by Docker but it has to be allowed in certain situations, and we'll see why. So it's, it's very difficult to generically apply a set of controlling bounding features, um, bounding kernel capabilities, rather, to any given process. Uh, hardened kernels are recommended, but I've, no one's going to compile their own kernel, are they? Um, <laughs> uh, so, and finally, security policies and whitelisting. So uh, AppArmor, Docker ships with the default AppArmor profile. We'll have a look at that again in a minute. Um, SE Linux and AppArmor are the Ubuntu and Red Hat flavors of the same kind of way of solving a problem that everyone's had a crack at. Kernel capabilities turned up. They were considered too complex or not granular enough in certain situations. Red Hat applied SE Linux. Again, it's, it's very difficult to get your head around. AppArmor is slightly nicer. SecComp is now a, a sort of vendor neutral approach to doing this. Um, Docker have decided themselves that this is even not enough and they're launching something called entitlements which are essentially buckets for groups of these things, plus um, read and write access to various file system paths, like the, the contents of PROC and things like that. Uh, it's, they're actually proposing it to Kubernetes now, and it's, uh, there's a slide about later, in fact, so let's wait for that. Uh, these are the number of people who are actually using security policies in production. I think it's reprehensible. I hope you'll all use them after this. Um, so, container security. We know these things, obviously, drop to an unprivileged user. This is because the user namespace mapping is not good. If you run as uh, a non-root user in a container, you actually give yourself a huge amount of security, which seems incongruous, but there you go. Uh, reduction of debugging tools in containers. It's important to run the minimum stack possible. And uh, it surprises me how many people don't know you can actually attach to a container namesp namespace. 
So here we're going double hyphen net container and then the ID of a container. So uh, if I have a misbehaving Nginx process, uh, or even better, a Go binary, which is running in a scratch image, so the only thing in that container is the binary. Um, the only way I can debug that is by getting the ID of the container, attaching to its network namespace with a, uh, a debug image, and then doing a, a sysdig, seeing what ports are open, seeing what network traffic's happening. That is then in the namespace of the container that I've attached to. So you can debug, you can enter with peered name, uh, peered in IPC, uh, you can mount the volumes from, um, from the hosts. You can do everything without actually going inside that container because containers don't exist. They're just a frame of reality and you can easily get that frame. Uh, various other things, uh, super user ID binaries, or no, set user ID, sorry, um, was again a way to try and work around kernel capabilities where you assume root permissions just to do one thing. They're, they're lethal, there have been so many bugs and vulnerabilities in them. Privileged containers afford absolutely no security. They just exist as a root-like deployment mechanism. Avoid them at all costs. Uh, capabilities, so we do have native extensions to add and remove capabilities. Ideally, drop everything and just add in the ones we need. This is more difficult than I'm making it sound. There are various vendors who will do this for you. There's a tool called Docker Slim, which will attempt to analyze the runtime behavior and dynamically pull out a list of system calls that you then need to whitelist. Everything else can get blacklisted. It's, um, it isn't an easy problem, but it's something you need to do if you want to defend against the future of, uh, of vulnerabilities. So, uh, Notary as well ensures content trust addressability so that you know what was shipped from Docker Hub and is now on your servers, it's the same thing. Starting with about Docker 1, 10 or 11, the SHA-256 of a Docker layer is actually representative of the contents. Before that, it was just a randomly generated string. But unless you turn on content addressability, Docker doesn't do anything, and it will just continue to work, even if someone has maliciously tampered with that. Obviously, to complete the chain of trust, you then need to GPG sign your Git commits, but um, every little helps. So uh, this is Moby having a pop at fixing um, security uh, capabilities in general. Uh, really interesting, this is going on right now. It's just been proposed to Kubernetes. If you're interested, I suggest you have a dig through that. Um, Kubernetes, just while we're on the subject, offers some security contexts. There are, there are two levels of just adding some extensions here. Um, and also SecComp is now available. So you can now apply the same capability-based bounding sets to containers, to whole deployments. Um, that's just an alpha, but it's super powerful. Again, security features getting shipped like three years after the project's begun. It's, it's completely standard. So, um, Kubernetes has some insecure defaults. Uh, obviously, speed of delivery is a feature, but as of 1.6, it's now role-based access controls. Uh, before that, uh, every single container has a security token mounted into it by default. So. If I was to, for example, run a heart bleed attack, so, sorry, run a shell shock attack, so that's a remote code execution. So I've got my laptop, I managed to find the container with this vulnerability, the payload of shell shock opens a shell back to my laptop, so I'm there on the container from my laptop. At that point, I can check for this mount grep secret, and you see run secret Kubernetes IO service account. That token is a cluster administrator level token mounted into every pod by default. Super insane, uh, don't know why they did it, but it's just been fixed now by RBAC in uh, 1.6. You have to configure your cluster to actually defend against this though, um, otherwise it's on by default. Uh, the kubelet to API server comms do not require authentication. So this is a known issue again, it's been open for ages. It means that from your container, you can talk to the open port on the host, which talks privileged, uh, which communicates in a privileged manner to the API, and you can then spin up a privileged container, and you've rooted the cluster again. Um, there's probably going to be a default change in 1.7 to make sure that that communication is encrypted and authenticated, but at this point, the only real solution is uh, where they're present in these images, uh, these repositories, but basically changing the way it runs by default. Uh, C Advisor is wide open. Um, it can be locked down with IP tables. You can't run it and protect the kubelet at the same time because of a strange catch-22. And of course, don't forget etcd, uh, which contains all the data in the cluster 
Uh, so just to recap on the container breakout. So if we repeat, repeat the same, yeah, okay. If we repeat the same thing again, but this time we will modify the App Armor profile that's running by default and look how easy it is to contain this process, knowing what it is. So all the same again. Uh, we do want to proceed, but this time we do want to run with App Armor. So what we can see here is the default App Armor profile, and here is our friend Ptrace. Now it's only being it's it's denied by default because it's the source of so many vulnerabilities. But here it's being given an exemption if the peer is Docker default. That is the name of this profile. So that means uh, this profile is applied to Docker. But when Docker is running it, then it can ptrace itself. Uh, you can see these are all the denials for various system and proc endpoints. These basically stop lots of malicious activity. Proc is basically an interface to all the system calls anyway, uh, as is some of the contents of sys. So uh, that's what it would look like by default. And if you keep your eye on the ptrace line, all we're going to do is disable ptrace. It's actually required for things like ps or strace. So it's a fundamental system administration primitive, if you like. Uh, so this is the kind of fix that you would just deploy when you knew there was a problem, and uh, then obviously patch everything up. Um, so importantly here, this guy is the one to have a look at. Uh, so we can actually, this line, app armor status, um, it's an app armor call that we are interested in. So proceed, We've got app armor, the modified profile, and it immediately seg faults, much like before. Uh, so what's happened here is this system call has been denied. The ptrace operation on the Docker default profile for the dead beef process has been denied. And if we look at how that reflects in, uh, da, 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 da. Uh, in the output of the system calls, then as soon as the process tries to clone itself with these ptrace permissions, Process control returns, uh, ptrace, trace me, gets an access denied, and seg faults immediately. So we've protected ourselves from an unknown, in this instance, um, vulnerability. And by reducing the system call exposure, then this is how we can lock down any process. Uh, obviously, that customization of the profile is um, unique to each and every application that runs. So, um, in the interest of time, I'm just going to whiz through these really quickly. There are some things to help you with generating these profiles. Uh, basically, don't security profile uh, security pipelines are um, still kind of the new frontier of continuous integration delivery. For some reason, uh, this stuff needs to run on every commit. Basically, uh, you can actually there's open source tooling to allow you to scan base images for CVEs. Claire's just uh, yeah, Claire's just hit version two. Uh, Linus is included for old school aesthetic. Uh, DocScan is a crazy wild exploit tool worth looking at. Um, some more stuff there. These guys will all do this same kind of dynamic scanning and syscall prevention for you uh, at a cost. Um, but they are uh, moving quickly and shipping a lot of features. Uh, Docker Bench Security deserves a mention. This is an open source tool which allows you to identify the state of your host. Basically, have I left anything open that I shouldn't have done, conforming to best practices as per the vendor. Uh, dependency analysis for your applications. Uh, SNCC will actually generate PRs for you with insecure dependencies and transfer dependencies. Magical tool. Uh, AFL is the, the fuzzer. I really recommend going and having a look at their homepage, and looking at the list of scalps that they've taken because they've basically broken everything. Uh, that's it in progress. Web application scanners. So uh, we have to use intrusion detection systems because despite all these layers of complex security, ultimately things will get broken into. Things always do. Everybody has been hacked. And so we should run intrusion detection systems in every, situa in every environment that contains tokens or keys to get to production. Um, so Falco is an open source version. It's really worth looking at. Uh, these are old version, new versions of old tools. Um, so is anything inherently secure? Well, we can agree that it's not. It's open source, more secure than proprietary. It doesn't matter because it's secure enough for our needs, as endorsed by major corporations and users. 
So this talk's been about scary, shiny, and vaguely interesting, hopefully, things. But they're not the only way people get hacked. Likely routes to exfiltration are the OWASP top 10. The application code that your developers ship is the most quickly changing part of your application and infrastructure, and it's also the most likely source of vulnerabilities. So prepare for the unexpected, secure your networks, application code, users' browsers, and when all else fails, run intrusion detection systems. Thank you very much.